Our scripture reading this morning will be coming from Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. I'll be reading from the New King James. And I saw it in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us by God, by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Very good morning to everyone this morning. I am so glad to have each of you here in the audience this morning in the, here at the church building, as well as you who are looking online. Glad to have you with us. I saw several that have uh, logged in and stated that they were here. Most of you know me quite well by this time. You've been, I've been preaching here for a few years now, and I hope that you've gotten to know my heart. I hope that you've gotten to see what kind of a preacher that I am. And uh, Just give me a second. Um. Hmm. Brother Doug's words really affected me. Because <clears throat> I, I know right where he's coming from. And, and I pray for our elders. I ask you to pray for our elders. They're making some very difficult decisions. They're having to navigate times that elders before them have not had to navigate uh, not in this lifetime. There might be some from the Spanish flu back in 1915 or something, but this is a different time. And I'll tell you, I'm, you know me well. You know that I'm very organized. Would you say that I'm a pretty organized preacher? <laughs> Usually know if I'm going to preach something, you know what it is. It's already planned out. Uh, even to let you know a few days ahead of time. And I have been struggling for the last two days of taking this sermon and just throwing it out because... Um, there's so many things that I want that say that are on my heart. And Casey did that last week. You know, he preached what was on his heart. He went for 50 minutes on that. You don't want me throwing away my sermon, y'all. <laughs> Trust me. I will go and go. I love you, Casey. You know I do. I can pick on Casey because he picks on me and we love each other. Casey's a fine preacher and, and the message he gave last week was wonderful. 
I would like to talk to you for a few minutes, though, before we get into this sermon. I am going to preach this sermon. But I like to just talk. Can we just talk for a minute? Now, this doesn't apply to everybody, but it does affect everybody. Can we just be honest and hear the words that Brother Doug said? John 13, 35. By this they will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There is truly nothing that hurts my heart more, and I know these elders more than seeing brethren say things on Facebook or say things to each other or say things in different ways. You know what's interesting and the thoughts that I had is that y'all are entering into the realm of preachers. You realize that? You're saying things and expecting people to change. But how often have you actually seen that happen? How often have you actually written something on Facebook and all of a sudden a whole bunch of people change? Oh, if you hadn't have said that, you know, we're welcome to our opinions. And I appreciate opinions. But that's all they are, they're opinions. And if we need, we can have an opinion, but we need to be kind to one another. We need to love one another. And that's exactly why preachers don't preach opinion. They should preach the Word of God. And what happens is, a lot of times, we get into judgmental opinions instead of measuring it by God's Word. And that's where we get into trouble. And so, I want to share with you an acronym that I really hope you'll take with you and you'll think about and you'll use. It's real simple. Stop. Stop. Just stop doing what you're doing. Can we ask you that? You know, the Bible tells us to stop. But think about those words, those letters, the word, the letter S. And just stop, S, stop. And think about what that requires. It requires self-control. Self-control is talked about in the Bible, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, 2 Peter 1, uh, chapter 1, where he talks about those virtues you add. Have self-control. So stop. Letter T, think. Sometimes if, you know, I can't tell you how many times I have written something and I've stopped and I thought about it and then I start hitting that delete button. You know, think. The Bible tells us we need to think. We need to use our brains. Come that we may reason with each other, says Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. And I could go on and on about how we need to, we need to use our brains. We need to think. Jesus is saying that same thing when he's talking about love. The letter O is observe. Observe what Jesus did. We have his example. How will they know the love if you know you're my disciples if you have love for one another? Where did they learn that? From Jesus Christ himself. He taught what that is. So observe what Jesus did. Observe what the scriptures say and read what the scriptures say. And if you want to call yourself a Christian, then act like a Christian. If you don't want to do that, if you want to act another way, then stop calling yourself a Christian. So observe. That means look at Jesus. Look in the scriptures. And then P. That's what you really need to be doing. You need to get on your knees and pray. We need to pray for this country. We need to pray for the church. We need to pray for our brethren who are struggling with this. Folks, I'm struggling with it too. I have just as many opinions as anybody else does. But I have to set an example because I want people to see Jesus in me. And my wife reminds me of that. Those times whenever I get angry. Those times when I want to shout. I love her so much because she says, practice what you preach. Be like Jesus. I knew this mask would come in handy for something. There we go. I'm sorry to get emotional, y'all, but listen, I love God. I love Jesus. I love the scriptures. 
I love you. I love God's church, and I love being a part of the church. And what I hate is to see Satan tearing us apart through this ridiculousness. Listen, a, a coronavirus is a real thing, and there are those who need to protect themselves. But as Brother Doug said, we forget that there's choice involved, just like there's choice to obey the gospel. There's choice involved. And so if you're going to the grocery store and going to different places and going to the restaurants and going everywhere else and, you, and you're a member of the Lord's church and you need to be in church. If you can go to those places, you can come here. Amen. There's nothing more dangerous about a church building than Lowe's or a restaurant or any other place. Amen. Now, if you have a compromised immune system, and we do have some brethren, I have several in my heart right now that I'm glad I don't see them here right now. And I love them, and I want to see them protected. But the elders have made it very clear, if that's you, you have the choice to stay home, to protect yourself. And that's what you should do. And the elders have said very clearly, and you should, we should all appreciate that. You're not going to be judged for that. We're not going to start screaming that you're forsaking the assembly. But I'm telling you right now, you, you need to be consistent. That's the key word, be consistent. We want you to, to be like Jesus. I could say so much more. Like I told you all, you don't want me to get off my script. My script. I'm going to keep going. So I hope that you hear my heart. And I might not have said it eloquently or might not have said it perfectly, but I hope you hear my heart that I love you and I want the best for you. But let's focus on God. Let's focus on what's important, and that is worshiping God, being with your brethren. We can do it safely, and let's focus on the eternal things, the spiritual things, and quit letting Satan manipulate us through the different means and methods that he has uh, been using lately. I think you can understand that well enough. All right, so thank you for letting me do that. I hope it's helped you. Doug, thank you for saying that. It meant a lot to me. How many of you like movies? How many of you have seen Alice in Wonderland? A <laughs> bunch of hands. How many of you have seen The Lion King? Or how about uh, even Star Wars? I know those, there's three real popular movies right there. Joe, did you, your hand didn't go up on one single? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought, wow. Um, what is it about those movies that's so fascinating? If you notice, each one of those movies has in common are animals. Certain animals that talk. When you go to, yeah, right? When you go to, like, for example, the Cheshire Cat, you know, and the Rabbit in, in Alice in Wonderland, that's just so fascinating, right? Whenever you think about Star Wars, there's Chewbacca. I know he's not a real animal, but hey, he's an animal that talks or sort of talks. Um, the Lion King, Simba, and all of them, they're all talking. Have you ever noticed our fascination with talking animals? that we like to assign human things to them. And so the question is, is why? Why do we anthropomorphize? <laughs> what that means is adding human characteristics to animals. <laughs> why do we do that? Have you ever actually seen an animal talk to you? I mean, like, really carry on a conversation. So it, why is it that man is so fascinated with that? Well... There is a lot of reasons why, you know, we use animals in different ways. For example, we will say things like, you know, he's as strong as an ox, or uh, he's as stubborn as a mule, or she's as graceful as a swan, and, and things like that. The reason we do that is because it's imagery that's just rich with, with, with description. It, it describes a person or a situation better than just saying it plainly. Well, that's exactly what we see in the Bible. That passage that Brother Elliot read in Revelation chapter 5, if you will turn there, if you aren't there already. In Revelation chapter 5, we see something so very fascinating. 
We see this throne room scene. And in that throne room scene, you see this figure that is, we recognize as God sitting on a throne. He has in his hand a scroll. And it is said that there's nobody worthy of being able to open that scroll. And so John, seeing this vision, begins to weep, begins to cry because of that. And so, as he is weeping, an angel comes and says, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy. And so you can imagine the imagery that must have come to John's mind. And then when he looks up, what does he see? Not a lion, but a blood-stained lamb. Fascinating that he's called a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, but then he sees a lamb. So the question becomes, how does that happen? How is Jesus both a lamb and a lion? And we're not talking about a lamb and a lion like living together. We're talking about he's the same person, the lion and a lamb. How is that even possible? And so as we consider that, that made me think, man, this would be a great sermon. You know, a lot of times for the last couple of three months, I've been preaching a lot of sermons about the current events and things like that. And I sat down this past Monday, to, as I typically do, to write my, start writing my sermons. And I thought, you know what, I want to preach about something I want to preach about. <laughs> I want to preach about Jesus and the qualities of Jesus. And as I looked at this, I thought, this is so fascinating. We've been studying Revelation on Sunday nights. And why is he called both a lion and a lamb? And I thought it would be a beneficial study, even in times like this, to help us know a little bit more about what Jesus is all about. And so I want to look at the lion today. Now this, I said if I go off script, I'm going to be here a long time preaching. Well, I also recognize that there's so much here that I can't put it all in one sermon. So we're going to break this up into two sermons. We're going to, this morning, we're going to look at the lion. And we're going to consider the lion of the jungle. We're going to consider the lion of the tribe of Judah and then the lion of judgment. And then next week, we'll look at the lamb. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to identify Jesus as the lamb. We see that often. and There's a lot of connections, and we'll build that up next week. But how often have we really thought about him as a lion? In fact, when was the last time you really thought about the lion of the jungle? When's the last time he really stopped and, and thought about God's creation, the one that he calls a lion? Just how incredible that animal is, how, how terrifying that animal is and respected that animal is. Have you ever seen a lion in real person, some of you? I have. There you go. I love it. Um, you go see them in a zoo. You know, there's these places like down in South Florida that, where Andrea is from called Lion Country Safari. You drive through and they're right out there by your car. It's kind of scary. Let me tell you, they are big, mean, ferocious animals. You consider the lion itself. I mean, that thing can stand up to five feet tall. All right. There can be six to seven feet long and as much as three to six hundred pounds. It's a big animal. The claws that they have have such force that it has been compared to that of a jackhammer. There's stories that a lion, just a swipe of his paw will, well, take your head right off, literally. He can roar, and you can hear that roar for five miles. That's how loud they can roar. They hunt in prize. You know, the lion is not actually the most powerful creature most powerful animal in creation but because of all of the abilities that he has and hunts in these packs these prides there's pretty much no animal that they can't overcome and so that's why they're called the king of the jungle even though they don't live in jungles <laughs> but they're called the king the king of the jungle and so I hope as you think about a lion, that's why that a lot of royalty and, and, and stateliness and dignitaries use them as symbols. 
You think about ancient Babylon, they had those big lions there. Uh, you go to some mansion, sometimes you'll see lions up front. It's always a symbol of, 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 of strength and courage. And that's the image I want you to see in your head. Now the Bible also talks a lot about lions. If you go and you look in events like in the story of Samson. I love that story where Samson's walking down the road and a lion comes along and he just rips that lion in two. It says, the Bible says he rips it in two as if he would tear a goat. I don't really tear goats that often, but apparently Samson was strong enough to do both. And then he goes on to use that lion in a riddle. You remember that? How the bees came and built a hive in there and he took the honey out of the carcass of that lion. Such a strange riddle but he used that riddle you see a lion also in David when David talks about how he would catch a lion by its beard and slay it if it came near the sheep that he was protecting you think about the lion that killed the young prophet of God who went and was prophesied of the king but then turned aside and when God told him not to and the lion came out and killed him you think about all the prophets that had to deal with lions, the most famous being Daniel and the lion's den. You also consider the fact that even the Bible calls Satan a lion. Remember that? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that it says he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. So the Bible uses these references more than a hundred times, talking about lions. And now here in Revelation Jesus is described as a lion. The point being is all those things we talked about. It means power and strength and respect and courage and skill and all these things that a lion has. It's there for a reason. The application is it's all about imagery. It's all about imagery, clarifying key characteristics of Jesus so that you can see what the vision is trying to tell you. See, mankind is very familiar with lions. We have a natural fear of those lions. We have respect for them because of their power and strength. So if you stop and think about it, it's absolutely perfect imagery to use to describe Jesus Christ. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at, that's the lion of the jungle. Let's look at the lion of Judah, the tribe of Judah. That's an expression that occurs only here in Revelation. One time in the whole Bible, Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Why? Well, because there are other passages that explain that. Keep your finger here, but go with me to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, or 1 through 10. We're going to see why he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And in this... So you understand what's going on, the context. You have Jacob here. Look in verse 1. Jacob called his sons. Jacob is an old, old man. He's on his deathbed, and he's about to pass away. And so he calls all of his children to him, gathers them together, it says in verse 2, and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. And then he goes down the list of his children, starting with the firstborn. Reuben, you are my firstborn. My might, my beginning, and strength. And you think, oh, wonderful, right? But then uh, we see that he goes on to describe Reuben, saying in verse 4, You are as unstable as water. You shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, and you defiled it, and he went to my cows. You have to go back and read the history of that in previous chapters. But Reuben basically forfeited his firstborn right because of disobedience. So Jacob is here to give blessings to his children, and Reuben does not receive one. Next comes Simeon and Levi, who are brothers. And he goes on to say, but your instruments of cruelty, their habitation, let not their soul enter the council, he goes on to say. And he goes on to show that they will be divided. Cursed be their anger. So here are his first three children who he calls together to give a blessing to. They don't receive a blessing, really. They see, receive more of a curse. This is what's going to happen to you. You're not going to excel. You're going to be divided. You're going to see violence. Then he gets to Judah. Judah, you are he 
whom your brothers shall praise. Fascinating. Because first of all, Judah, the word itself, means to be praised, to celebrate. And so, as we see from history, that this prophecy is going to come true. Because here you have 12 sons, all right? And those 12 sons build their families, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow, as you see in the next book in Exodus. And you see that those 70 people that are of those 12 sons and their father Jacob that went down to Egypt grew into a mighty nation known as Israel. And so each one of those children, their father, they took on the name of their father to become a tribe of people. To the point by the time Moses calls them out, it's estimated they could be anywhere from a million to two million people in that nation. So these 12 boys turn into 12 tribes. And so the tribe of Judah, he says, that's the one that you shall, your brothers shall praise and hand shall be on the neck of the enemies. And so as we see that they would wind up exactly what he's saying here. They would wind up having dominion over all the other tribes as seen in descendants of people like Caleb. You remember Caleb was of the tribe of Judah. He was a mighty warrior. And then you see David who was of the tribe of Judah, also a mighty warrior. And then he goes on to promise that the Messiah would come through the tribe of Judah. He promises him, for example, in David, once you get to that part of it, he says, But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you, and your house, your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. You look at other passages like Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Micah 5, verse 2, the fulfillment in Matthew 2, verse 6, and you see that indeed the Messiah comes through Judah, that Judah is become the kingly tribe. And that's exactly what we see as he talks about your father's children shall bow down before you. Now look at what he says in verse 9. Judah. Here's how we make the connection between Revelation and Genesis. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him. Judah is a lion's, club, lion's cub. So the tribe of Judah from this prophecy will grow into a mighty strong tribe just like a lion cub. Can you imagine a cute little cub? Have you ever seen a little lion? They're so cute. But man, when they get grown, they're not so cute anymore because they're mature. They are animals of prey and they will kill you. <laughs> and so Judah grows the same way. Then he says, the most powerful prophecy. The scepter, verse 10, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now he said, you're going to be the tribe that's praised. They're going to be bowing down to you. You're like a lion cub. And then he makes it very clear, the scepter shall not depart. If you know anything about ancient history, you know that kings held in their hands a scepter. Go to the book of Esther, and you'll see where that king would extend it to people who would come into the courtyard. And if he didn't, you would die. It's a sign of power. He is royalty. And so again, it shows that Judah would become the tribe of kings. It says here he's a lawgiver. Well, that's what kings and laws, uh, rulers do is they make laws. And when you stop and think about what Jesus is in regards to that, he is a king, he is a ruler, and we are living under the law of Christ at this time. And so the Messiah is showing would come from the tribe of Judah. Law would come from the tribe of Judah. And that word until Shiloh comes. That's a kind of an obscure word that is used sometimes for the one who is to be sent. He who is sent. That's a reference to Jesus Christ. It's a subtle reference Jacob is speaking out this blessing to his children on his deathbed, saying, my sons, this is what's going to happen to each one of you. And he looks at Judah and says, you're going to be a mighty tribe. You're going to be the one that God's 
plan, scheme of redemption is going to be fulfilled through as the Messiah comes through that. He doesn't know that he's saying all that. But God has touched his heart, his work, the Spirit's working through him, if you will, and he utters those words. And as we read in 1 Peter that even the angels didn't really know God's plan. All the prophets wanted to know what God's plan was, but they didn't understand it at the time. Looking back, we can see that is indeed Jesus. And so he goes on to say that the root of David, he goes on in, in this passage talking about the root of David. And what he's saying there is that David would be the first lion of the tribe of Judah, even though he's not called that. But it's his throne that was established, and then that's the throne in which Jesus Christ would come through. And Jesus, therefore, fulfills all of these prophecies, all of these things, because he has all authority. He has, he has he, all the praise. Hebrews 7, verse 14, It is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, which the tribe of Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. In Revelation 5, we see that praise coming to that king, to that lion. He's victorious over his enemies. He is a, a king that all creation bows down to him. And he is in his kingdom, ruling in his kingdom right now, that is still prospering lasting forever until he delivers it up to the Father. So what this does, it depicts Jesus with the most powerful, graphic, symbolic imagery that you can possibly imagine to help you remember, to help fix it in your mind, to help you see that Jesus Christ is the ultimate expression of the Lion of the tribe of Judah as it relates to Judah. He is that ultimate expression in this beautiful imagery, this symbol that the inspired writer, in this case Jacob, an inspired prophet, uttering. Such beautiful imagery. Now let's look at what that means. That he is the lion of judgment. Because there's another point that needs to be brought out here. While that's interesting that you see all that imagery, there's an application that goes here at a point that a lot of people don't want to talk about. And that is that lions render judgment. When you stop and think about what a lion actually does, there's a few things about a lion. For example, just like all cats, has incredible nighttime vision. So much so that he is at a great advantage over his prey. And what does that mean? I see an application there to Jesus. If a lion can peer into the darkness and expose what's in the darkness, that's exactly what Jesus does as the light. He can peer into the darkness. He can expose that which is evil, expose that darkness. That's what we read in John chapter 1. It's a matter of judgment by exposing that that's in darkness. Lions also are known for protecting their territory. And that their territory is maintained. You don't walk into a lion's territory. You don't take it over. What did Jesus say about his own kingdom? That he would establish that kingdom and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so there's that territory. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. There's that territory that he has and his kingdom will never fail. The other thing too that when I say a lion of the judgment. Lions make decisions about life and death you know most animals in the animal kingdom are just doing all that they can to survive i i love to hunt deer but at the same time my heart sometimes feels for those deer because it's like everybody wants to kill them everywhere they turn and you think about it and so they're constant i couldn't imagine uh, you know, I lived in, when we lived in Paraguay, I remember just being constantly looking over my shoulder and, and being aware and trying to make sure that we weren't in any danger because there, danger does lurk in many different places there in Paraguay, whether it be somebody who's going to rob you, whether it be somebody who's not paying attention and run you over, whether it be stepping off uh, into a, uh, they don't have handrails and stuff like that in Paraguay, stepping off a, a ladder, excuse me, a, a a platform or something you're constantly looking around and that's how I feel like those animals are sometimes well the lion's not that way 
In fact, you read in Isaiah that as a lion was coming in, they were banging their, and making noise and banging their pots and pans and trying to scare the lion away, and he was undeterred. He just kept coming because he was just trying to determine what his prey is going to be. See, I see the application with Jesus there. A lion makes a decision about what animal is going to die if he decides he's going to attack that lion. That's judgment. There's the connection I'm making there. That a lion makes a judgment. Well, we're going to be under the judgment of Jesus Christ. He has the power of judgment that we will all kneel before Jesus. Romans 14, 10, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And so there's the application. Returning back to our passage in Revelation chapter 5. You know, if I had been in John's shoes and I saw what was happening and I was him and I was weeping because I could see the plight of man and I could see the problem that we're in and then whenever that angel says to me that they're all the lion of the tribe of Judah, I would think, yes, that's exactly what we need. Something like a lion. And I would look up and see that little lamb and go, what? You said lion. We need a lion. Now's the time for a lion. You see, that's what I want you to see. I, I want you to see the imagery of what John is feeling. But yet Jesus is both. He is the lion. And he is the lamb. And therefore, as you look at this, you need to understand all the implications that are going on right there. First of all, the fact that he is the lion it shows the impossibility of anyone else taking that scroll. You see, there's, there's something that we've overlooked sometimes, is that John recognized not a single human being, no living creature was capable of taking that scroll. Nobody's just going to walk over and take that scroll out of the hand of God. Something like a lion could, described as a lion. He could walk over, he could do that, he could take charge he, could, he has the ability to be able to do that. And so that's why it says that no one on the earth or under the earth or in heaven could do that. And it shows if that's the case, then it disqualifies everybody else. I don't, it doesn't matter how great you are. So that means that the greatest politicians, the greatest kings, the greatest dictators, anybody, whoever you want to think of, no scientist, no philosopher, no uh, judge, no lawyer, no engineer, no doctor, no artist, no anybody is capable of taking that scroll. Not even, not even godly men, not even people like Abraham, not even people like David or Elijah, Daniel, John the Baptist, Paul the Apostle, none are capable of taking that scroll. Why? Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why John weeps. That's why he cries. Do you realize that even angels weren't capable of taking that scroll? They didn't sin, but they were created, into, created beings, but they didn't give their blood for humanity there's the connection with the lamb and the one that we'll make even more so next week when we talk about the lamb but i want you to stop and imagine emphasize and see why john wept because no one was found worthy so in all of this the whole reason for this sermon and hopefully you'll take this with you as you learn this passage and that is that you see the preeminence of Jesus Christ. The primary intent of this passage is for you to see how wonderful Jesus is and all that power and all that he has and that's what the proclamation is. So let's hear it again. Read the passage again and think about it now after all that we've said about the lion. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold the lion. Isn't that more powerful now? Doesn't that mean a lot more to you now? The lion of the tribe of Judah. 
Doesn't that have more impact now? And mean a lot more to you? You understand it might now more? The root of David has triumphed. And then listen to the words. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. So yes, Jesus is a lamb. Jesus is a lion. He's bold and he's powerful. He is able and he is worthy. Because he has such power, only Jesus alone is capable of taking that scroll from the right hand of God and opening those seals, which means he's carrying out God's judgment, carrying out God's will. Only Jesus is capable of doing that. Such powerful, incredible imagery. I get uh, chills when I think about that throne scene in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And to be able to see what John saw. And so thankful that John was able to write that down and share it with us so we could see that imagery. It is not a coincidence that he is called the uh, the line of the tribe of Judah. It's powerful imagery to help us see how marvelous and wonderful and powerful and the preeminence that Jesus has. Again, I hope this has helped you see that more clearly this morning and helped you, uh, ho- help you appreciate Jesus more. We started out by talking about we need to look to Jesus. That's what's going to fix the world. That's what's going to fix the problems that we have right now in America is Jesus Christ. Well, the only way Jesus is going to do that is if we study about him and we look to him and we understand him. And we need to understand he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. This time we're going to extend the invitation of Jesus Christ. He says, come unto me and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11. That invitation is open to those because he is coming to this world. The reason he did all this is because he is fulfilling God's will. To bring the gift of eternal life to us. The only way you can have that gift is through obedience. By believing that Jesus is the Son of God. By, uh, by repenting of your sins, Luke 13, 3. By confessing that he is that Son of God. Matthew 10, verse 32, and then being baptized, Mark 16, 16, which then adds you to the church, Acts 2, verse 47. If you haven't done that, you need to do that so that you can be a son of life, that you can be a child of God, that you can be a Christian, that you can be part of the body of Christ. Or if you've had some problems in your life and you need the prayers of the church, we can help you in any way. Please let it be known. As together we stand and sing. Will you come?